the photograph of that boy, that Kurdish boy, Elan Kurdi, right? In the last four years, you, we, we, I've never heard of Libyan refugees and Syrian refugees in my life. The only Syrian migrant we know of is Steve Jobs, but we never heard of Libyan and Syrian refugees. In the last four years, you have Somali, Libyan, Ethiopian, all kinds of children drowning in the seas of the Mediterranean, trying to get to Spain and Italy. We never saw a photograph. All of a sudden, we saw a photograph of Ailan Kurdi on the beaches of Greece. The Lemon newspaper of Paris, uh, of Paris brought out the entire expose. We all got taken in, you know, emotions and we were all very sad. Of course, the child did die. The child was lying on a different part of the beach, a very rocky part of the beach. He was shifted to the sandy part of the beach and his photograph was taken. Levon actually published all those photographs. Then Erdogan raised the issue that Syria Assad is responsible for the refugees. The refugees were being facilitated by a CNN report that they were be, being put into buses in towns. Police were guarding those buses. They were taken to the Turkish port of Izmir and seven kilometers across there to the port of Greece. It was all being done openly. There are, uh, the entire Turkish police and the intelligence was, uh, was involved in this operation, along with the smugglers. Everybody was making a lot of money out of it. So these refugees start flowing into Europe. And then starts the cry that the refugees are coming because Assad is killing them. Now what is the demographic situation within Syria? It's a population of 23 million people, a little more than Bombay, a little less than Delhi. Out of these 23 million people, 4 million are refugees. That leaves 19 million people. With the 19 million people, half the population within Syria is displaced. Internally displaced people, as they're called. Where are the majority of the people within Syria staying? 80% at least, if not more. Some people say 90%. But 80% of the Syrian population moves to government-held areas. They're staying in Damascus, they're staying in Latakia, Tartus, mainly on the, where they're safe with the government, with the government, with the Syrian army and the government. 80% of the Syrian population moves towards the territory held by, the, by their own government. The entire design of the Turkish design failed even at the time of Ailan Kurdi and again at the time of the Paris attack because you have a Paris attack, who did it, not did it, I'm not even going to it. But at least I know one thing, that terrorists do not carry passports when they go to carry and when they want to go to heaven. You don't need a, heaven, you don't need a passport to get to heaven. So why carry a passport? But the Syrian passport was that Syria is involved and then the Brits start bombing. In the last 15 days, the British have bombed in Syria only three times. They don't have targets to bomb actually, because they don't want to bomb ISIS. Their wires come for the videos with the guy. No, I think there's a sound problem. That guy is waiting. For, anyway, no problem. No problem. Okay. Now, uh, how do you end this ISIS story? It is very simple to end the ISIS story, or the Al Qaeda, or the Jabhat al-Nusra, and all that is that is happening. The camps are operating in Turkey and in Jordan mainly, and in the Golan Heights, controlled by Israel. You shut down the camps. You shut down the funding. Shut down the weapon supply. And these guys will go back to the hundred countries that they came from. So one is to shut down the terror networks is a very simple task if they're really committed to the agenda. Where is the funding going from? The funding is going from the Saudis, Kuwaitis, Bahrain, Qatar. These are the main sources of funding. They say it is private finances, but these private finances are known to the government. It is being done by bank transfers from London to Turkey. It is all operating very openly. Okay. And Turkey is the main base for these operations. The other point is that are there solutions to the Syrian crisis or to the Iraq crisis? There are solutions to Yemen, to Libya, to all these places. But they cannot be resolved in the context of my Islam is the only way, or my sect is the only way, you cannot create a Shia Islamic state and expect Sunnis to accept a Shia Islamic state. You cannot create an Islamic Sunni state in Syria and expect the minorities in Syria to live as second class citizens because that is what Dhimis finally are, protected citizens. 
it requires national projects. And what does it mean? In Iraq, where the Shias are 60% and the Kurds are 20% and the Arab Sunnis are 20%, you finally have to have a constitution which gives equal rights to all the citizens and to all the religions. There's no other way to do it. Okay? In Syria, and I, I, I'm ashamed of Muslims who say that Assad is an Alawite, how can he rule over a Sunni majority country? When I used to hear these statements, I used to tell them, by Manmohan Singh, our Pradhan Mantri, hai. tomorrow you want a Muslim to become a Prime Minister of this country. You cannot say that Assad is this sect and that religion, that is why he cannot become a Prime Minister or President of a country. Okay. The point is that, be it, what is the kind of support that Assad has in that country? Going through these three visits, even meeting the uh, Indian Embassy, because the Indian Embassy is one of the few functioning embassies in Damascus, most have got out of that place. We tried to act as me and Jatin Desa, you know, we visited the Embassy twice and we said that after all this, who will vote for Assad? So the Indian Embassy, who are doing a lot of hard work over there, they said, listen, from our understanding, and we have been here through the entire course of the wars in 2011, 70 to 80 percent of the Syrian population is with the President. NATO quotes 70 percent. Al Jazeera quotes 56 percent way back in 2012. Okay. Now, how do you finally resolve Syria? This one must go, that one must go. Is that the way that the Americans want? Finally, we are saying hold elections. Let it be under United Nations auspices. Let there be United Nations observers and international observers and CNN and Al Jazeera in every polling booth in that country, no problem at all. But let there be free and fair elections in Syria for people to decide who the leader will be, who the party will be, who the cabinet will be. There's no other way to do that entire thing. And in this cabinet of 15, apart from Assad, all the rest of, of, of them are Sunnis. In fact, the tragedy is there is no Christian leader in that entire thing. 80 to 85 percent of the Syrian army is Sunni. If if it was only a matter of the strength of the army on which Assad was standing and not the party, the army would have moved out, Assad would have collapsed within two weeks. It's been five years now. 2011, March, since the entire crisis started. My own Christian friends have told me, because the Christians are facing an ethnic cleansing from Iraq to Syria to all over the region. They are in a rural crisis. And they've been abandoned by the West. Today it is the Russian Orthodox Church, Russia, and Putin that are standing by the Christians of the East. They've given up on France, they've given up on the Vatican. Now what do my Christian friends tell me? That basically Assad has a solid block of 60% of support. The 30% who oppose him are the, basically the forces that support parliamentary reform in Syria. And there are a 10% group of extremist Islamists who are opposed to Assad for whatever reason. But 90% they say is now totally opposed to what is happening uh, in terms of the, you know, the international war that has been imposed on, on Syria. And it is, it is not a civil war. It, it was basically, and it is, an externally imposed war on Syria. Because even the first Arab League Committee report way back in 2011 and uh, April, there was an Arab League Committee that went into Syria to find out the solution. The Arab League Committee said that if this country heads for a war, because the militants have weapons, the government has weapons, this war in Syria will ruin the entire world. It requires a political solution. The Qataris and the Saudis dumped that into the garbage bin because they thought they could do a Libya and Syria. Uh, now, why did the Russians come in and what's actually happening? And what about the Indian situation? Why do Modi and Nawaz Sharif actually meet in Ufa and then again in, uh, in, in Islamabad? The Russians are there for a very clear reason. The Chinese are backing them for a very clear reason. The Russians know that they made a big mess when they did not veto the American role in Libya. Now, why did that not happen? Because there is, within Russia, there, is, there are two camps operating. It's not that Putin is the whole and sole leader of Russia. He does appear so, but that is not the entire reality. There are two camps within Russia. One is the Putin-led camp, which handles the security and stands for, the, for a nationalist Russia. And the other is the Medvedev camp, which actually controls the central bank and the financial institutions of Russia. So one is the Putin camp called the Eurasian Integrationist camp. What is the Eurasian Integrationist camp? Eurasia and Asia. That is why Putin talks of a Eurasian Union. 
and the other is the anglo zionist american camp of medvedev which control the financial structures of uh, of of russia so these actually camps are also battling it in within russia so why does putin into putin enter into uh, into syria the reality was that in till 2014 the syrian army was beginning to win the war but 2015 january onwards again the tide began to change because the turkish army and other elements were actually involved and the syrian are the syrians are a small country it's only 23 million you know and and their army could not actually deal with the kind of uh, what they were facing so in the north in idlib in aleppo the kind of flow that was coming they had to stop the flow the turkish air force was active ensuring cover to uh, the militants who were flowing in from turkey the syrian air force actually could not in operate in the north in the south you would have the israelis actually providing aerial protection to the to the militants and the israelis have bombed damascus more than six times at the least in the last 3 years attacking hezbollah attacking other forces in syria who are fighting the isis russia understood that if they did not bury the isis in syria then these flames were going to come into dagestan into chechnya into uzbekistan kazakhstan and china xinjiang and finally into afghanistan pakistan to kashmir the isis had to be buried in syria and in iraq that is why the russians have gone in but the russians are not making that error of afghanistan they are not going to put in ground troops the syrian army the hezbollah iran is also active iraq is active it's actually syria has become an international battlefield all kinds of forces are active in syria but but the russians have lost that one pilot uh, due to turkish perfidy but the turks are paying for it uh, that's one element uh, the, the russian role has begun to change the entire tide of the battle in syria and along with it the global geopolitical balance is also changing in favor of the east where nato and the western powers on the decline military politically and economically that is how important the battle of uh, uh, syria is the other important element here is the kurdish question the syrian kurds who actually came into syria post world war 1 and 2 when the ottoman empire there was a the first uh, genocide of the 20th century was actually the armenian genocide 1.5 million armenians were massacred by the ottoman empire not many muslims know about that not many want to discuss about that but a lot of them were killed a lot of them crucified all that has happened the kurds the alawites even other sections lebanese sunnis a lot of arabs have also faced a uh, lot of that uh, you know destruction during world war 1 and afterwards so this little community of the kurds in syria has stood strongly and has been able to de defeat the isis in in the north the kurds the turks don't want that to happen and that is why they are attacking the the, the kurdish po population to in uh, syria and also in okay okay oh, sorry okay yeah okay i'm done here i just want to show the videos now okay so i think uh, we'll do uh, so these videos are very nice short 2 3 minute videos i want you all to run through them and then we'll come back to i think we'll open it up for discussion this is also you know everybody is against the isis so what is actually happening no no let's stop it okay well this way 12 your agency was saying quote the salafists the muslim brotherhood and al qaeda in iraq are the major forces driving the insurgency in syria mm -hmm. in 2012 the us yeah. was helping coordinate arms transfers to those same groups why did you not stop that if you're worried about the rise of quote unquote yeah, islamic extremism i mean i hate to say it's not my job but that my job was to was to ensure that the that the accuracy of our intelligence that was being presented was was as good as it could be and i will tell you it, it goes before 2012 i mean when we were when we were in iraq and we still had decisions to be made before there was a decision to pull out of iraq in 2011 i mean it was very clear what we were what we were going to face well i admire your frankness very on this subject very clear what we were going to let face let me let me just to one before we move on just to clarify once more you are basically saying that even in government at the time you knew those groups were around you saw this analysis sure. and you were arguing against it but who wasn't listening i think the i think the administration 
The administration turned a blind eye to your analysis. I don't know if they turned a blind eye. I think it was a decision. I think it was a willful decision. A willful decision to go support an insurgency that had Salafists, Al Qaeda, well, and a Muslim willful decision to do what they're doing, which which you have to really you have to really ask the president, what is it that he actually is doing with the with the uh, policy that is in place because it is very very confusing. I'm sitting here today, Maddie, and I don't I can't tell you exactly what that is, and I've been at this for a long time. Words are because of willful decision. Okay. About 10 days after 9-11, I went through the Pentagon and I saw Secretary Rumsfeld and, and Deputy Secretary Wolfowitz. I went downstairs just to say hello to some of the people on the joint staff who had used, used to work for me. And one of the generals called me and he said, sir, you got to Come in, you got to come in and talk to me a second. I said, well, you're too busy. He said, no, no. He says, we've made the decision we're going to war with Iraq. This was on or about the 20th of September. I said, we're going to war with Iraq. Why? He said, I don't know. <laughs> he said, I guess they don't know what else to do. So uh, I said, well, did they find some information collect connecting Saddam to Al Qaeda? He said, no, no. He says there's nothing new that way. They just made the decision to go to war with Iraq. He said, I guess it's like we don't know what to do about terrorists, but we've got a good military and we can take down governments. And um, he said, I guess if, if the only tool you have is a hammer, every problem has to look like a nail. So I came back to see him a few weeks later. And by that time, we were bombing in Afghanistan. I said, are we still going to war with Iraq? And he said, oh, it's worse than that. He said, he reached over on his desk, he picked up a piece of paper, and he said, I just, he said, I just got this down from upstairs, meaning the Secretary of Defense office today, and he said, this is a memo that describes how we're going to take out seven countries in five years, starting with Iraq and then Syria, Lebanon, Libya, Somalia, Sudan, and finishing off Iran. The truth is about the Middle East is, had there been no oil there, It's not a secret that Israel wants Assad fall to break down the Iranian Hezbollah Syrian axis, the biggest threat to Israel. Israel has struck Syria several times since the start of the crisis. It downed a Syrian jet fighter over the occupied Golan Heights, which was tracking the rebels led by al Nusra. This morning, a Syrian aircraft infiltrated Israel's airspace. Um, our defense capabilities, our Patriot Air Force uh, defense mechanism intercepted the aircraft um, and we are currently reviewing the incident. Such attack raises more questions about the Israeli involvement in the Syrian conflict. Indeed, it has been well known that Israel has been providing medical care to the rebels who get injured during the fight with the Syrian army in the Israeli hospitals where perhaps some will return to carry on the fight. كانت الفصائل تتلقى الدعم تتلقى الدخل الجرحى ما قام الأمر المشروط اللي هو تأمين منطقة الجدار الإسرائيلي. At the same time, ONDOF reports show that IDF Syrian rebels' interactions were not limited to medical care. Israeli forces were seen handing two boxes to them on the Israeli-Syrian line of the occupied Golan Heights. أعطونا الأثير الروسية وشوية دخيرة. The reports do not distinguish various Syrian militants groups fighting against the Syrian army, despite al Qunaitira was reported to be controlled by al Nusra Front. It seems that Israel seeks to make al Qunaitira a buffer zone. However, Israel this time uses the extremist Islamist groups not only to keep the Syrian army distant, but also to fight in the name of jihad. M. Abbas, MEC. And on top of that, I am concerned about this report about Syrian rebels and the ceasefire with ISIS. Uh, Senator but that's Paul, not true. Well, it's not true. Uh, it's not true. The, uh, Whether I don't care about the report. I know these people intimately. We talk to them all the time. 
but also let me point out that um, if we are going to conduct a conflict the way you are describing it is, and I'm afraid that's the case. This is reminiscent of Vietnam, the gradual escalation that ended up in one of the worst defeats that America has ever suffered. Let me ask you about what your colleague Rand Paul said about it this morning. He said it's a mistake to arm them. Most of the arms that we've given the so-called moderate rebels have wound up in the hands of ISIS because ISIS simply takes it from them or it is given to them and we mistakenly actually um, end up giving it to some radicals. How, how, look, things has are Rand very... Paul, has Rand Paul ever been to Syria? Has he ever met with I, ISIS? Has I, I, he I'm ever met with, with fight, any sir. of these people? No, no, no. I, they, we're going to have a fight because it's patently false. This is the same Rand Paul that said we didn't want to have anything to do with, with anything to do in the Middle East, by the way. I don't want to get in a fight with him at all. Yeah. But it's not true. I know these people. I'm in contact with them all the time. All right, let me and ask he is you this. Not. tankers operating that are taking the oil from Iraq and Syria into Turkey. Kilometers and kilometers of oil tankers are there. As the Western countries campaign against Syrian President Bashar al-Assad continues, I went undercover inside Turkey to get to the bottom of the crisis and to find out how Turkey contributes to the problems inside Syria. In this edition of In Focus, we set out for an investigative mission in Turkey to uncover Turkey's pivotal role in Syria's insurgency. Turkish government has been a key player for Western countries to execute their plots against Syrian President Bashar al-Assad. Turkey made it happen by opening its borders with Syria to the anti-Bashar militant groups, widely known in the West as the Free Syrian Army. It has not only funded the militants, but it has also supplied them with weapons and equipment inside its territory before entering Syria. In this edition of In Focus, we set out for an investigative mission in Turkey to uncover Turkey's pivotal role in Syria's insurgency. Early last year, when the conflict initially began between government forces and foreign-backed militants, calling themselves the Free Syrian Army, Turkey furtively allowed its borders to be taken over by anti-Assad forces. The only current border legally controlled by the Syrian army is that of Ladiye. The borders remain unpatrolled as foreign-backed militants import and export weapons freely. As I was able to approach one of the border crossings named Bab al Hawa, I encountered an estimated 300 semi-trucks on the border awaiting militants to empty them out. In order to enable swift arms transfer, militants on the Syrian side of the border are now using their own passport stamp. I spoke with several militants who stated that if they were to see a legal stamp from the Syrian government, they would most likely kill the person carrying it. 
ما في عسكر العسكر واقف بالقرقول بالمخفر بس اما يروح هكذا اما يعين مغمض عيونه وما ما يلقط له شيء ما يروح ويفوتش كيف ابد الناس من ابده ما يروح ويجي لكيفه وما حد ما يقول له شيء بعد اللي كنت هلا بلشوا يجوا منخشع على الطريق ليبي من شما من المغرب من فهم تعرف اي نعم هون موجودين بيجوا بينزل بالمطار او بيجي بالباص بينزل بمطاكي بيرتاح له بيستريح يومين ثلاثه وبعدها بيروح من هون على الحرم بيروح ليالا داق او لالتونوس يدفعون كلياتهم مصاري ما يدفعون لهم ما يعطون شهريات ما يعطون مصاري ما يقولون لهم على الجهات ما يقولون هون جهات هم محل The American Air Base located inside Turkey, Inkerlik, has been of strategic importance to the disturbance because it has enabled the Turkish government to facilitate the movement of arms without facing public scrutiny. The base is located eight kilometers east of the Turkish city of Adana. Sources say when weaponry arrives, it is given to two American and one Mexican men. We either distribute them among refugee camps or across the border into Syria. Turkish military officials ensure the weapons are transferred swiftly and discreetly to Syria. President Bashar al-Assad has blamed the Turkish government specifically for the uproar inside Syria, while media reports have revealed that terrorists received Israeli weapons via Turkey. They were loaded up on three Israeli planes. Meanwhile, the funds needed for the purpose have been provided by Qatar and Saudi Arabia. Syria's foreign ministry in a letter to the United Nations blamed Turkey along with Qatar and Saudi Arabia for sponsoring terrorists inside Syria. Syria's state TV blamed Turkish Prime Minister Recep Tayyip Erdogan for a powerful blast that reached the Syrian city of Aleppo, just across the Turkish border. The West is against me. Many Arab countries, including Turkey, which is not Arab, of course, against me. And if the, people, if the Syrian people are against me, how can I be here? should focus on external enemy, not internal enemy. Even if you have internal enemy like terrorism, uh, you have society that could help you at least not to uh, provide the terrorists with incubator. In that case, it's a new kind. We have a new kind of war. Terrorism through proxies. Either Syrians living in Syria or foreigner fighters coming from abroad. So it's a new style of war. This is first so you have to adapt with this new style it takes time it's not easy okay. and to say this is easy uh, as easy as a normal or let's say traditional or regular war no it's much more difficult second the support that they've been had that's been offered to those terrorists in every aspect armaments money political is unprecedented so you have to expect that it's going to be tough war and difficult war you don't say it, you don't expect a small country like syria to defeat all those countries that have been fighting us through proxies mm -hmm. just in days or weeks. This is Erdogan. I think he believes that if Muslim Brotherhood take over in the region, and especially in Syria, he can guarantee his political future. This is one reason. The other reason, personally, he thinks that he is the new Sultan of the Ottoman, and he can control the region as it was during the Ottoman Empire under a different, let's say, umbrella which is the Islamic, but not the Ottoman Empire, not to be Khalifa. Press, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know, Camps have been put up throughout Turkey for the purpose of sheltering over 120,000 refugees in the crossfire between foreign-backed militants and Syrian government forces. This lady told me the Turkish government is good with them. 
However, prices have raised extremely since they arrived. We are supposed to get eight, she said, but they come once and then never again. Every time we ask for eight, they disgrace us, so we go once and then never again. They have the aid, but it's very hard to get. We need aid because prices are outrageous. Bread alone has been raised to 400 Syrian lira. This man said the camps are up to standards and that there is proper food and medical care and that the only thing he's missing is to go back to his country. This refugee had the same tone while saying he is happy at the camps and feels at home but still longs to go back to Syria. While others are camps set up as training facilities for the rebels. My attempt to enter the camp was unsuccessful as it is heavily guarded by Turkish military. We were, however, able to shoot video of the camps from afar as guards at the door warned of snipers in the watchtowers ahead. The camp that holds some turned insurgent former Syrian army generals is in the Turkish town of Apaydan. My producer was able to get a hold of one of the generals living inside the camp. After a relationship was established with money involved, he offered to give us pictures of the weapons inside, thus admitting that the camps are not for civilian refugees, exactly what they've been trying to conceal from the public. A Turkish journalist was able to discover one of the hidden military camps in the Turkish city of Chakoli. The Chakoli camp alone holds 7,500 armed men. The Turkish journalist from the Yunus Daily newspaper was the first person to uncover the hidden military camps in between the mountains in what seemed to be a small forest. This particular camp lays right on the border of Syria and Turkey. So when the story was reported, the militants were quick to take their weapons and place them one meter inside Syria. I went to visit Turkish journalist Omar Demis to get information on his findings. Düğüm <gülüyor> İranlı şey pardon Iraklı Irak'ta savaşanlar Libya Afganistan'da savaşanlar Libya'da savaşanlar bunların tümünden Somali'de Sudanlı dahil olmak üzere radikal İslamcı cihatçı öbek öbek gibi. Çerkezler dahil olmak üzere var işte. Türkiye'de el kaideciler var. Upon arrival, Mr. Demis had informed me he had over 20 warrants for his arrest. One of them being a 10-year jail sentence for speaking out against the Turkish government. Mr. Demis was also able to supply me with pictures of some of the insurgents inside the camps. The pictures revealed that not all of the insurgents fighting in the so-called Syrian uprising are Syrian, but in fact, mercenaries from various countries sent into Syria via Turkey. Certain nationals from different countries, most notably Saudi Arabia, Africa, Afghanistan, Libya, and Morocco, are entering Turkey without question. They are then escorted by Turkish military officials to the border region to join the insurgent militants, either in Syria or in the refugee camps. Local residents are now filled with dissent as armed insurgents have moved out of border towns into the cities, where crimes such as theft have recently risen. Store owners informed me insurgents would openly and freely steal from their shops. Restaurant owners also complained of insurgents ignoring to pick up the bill. When asked for money, they would say they were guests of the Turkish Prime Minister Erdogan. 
عم تروح لهم اسلحه من من هنا كمان من هنا عم تروح لهم اسلحه علشان يحاربوا ضد الاسد نحن ما بدنا هالشيء نحن ما بدنا هون شعب مسلح نحن عايشين من سنين وايام بهدوء وبسكون ما بدنا تنخرب نحن مزاجنا ما يعني مو عايزين ينخرب هلا الدوله عم تشجعهم والشعب انطاكي عم يعمل مظاهرات علشان وطبعا علشان ما يصير نحن عندنا مشاكل نحن ما بدنا مشاكل بس كل يعني كل نريده نحن نحن مشاكل ما بدنا بس الدوله هون عم تشجعهم The Hatay province, which is known for its wide religious diversity, was taken by surprise when insurgents tried to infiltrate their quiet, peaceful town. Residents say they carried weapons and didn't look like your ordinary civilians, let alone refugees, but rather militants trying to cause a sectarian conflict. The residents of Hatay stood side by side to push back the insurgents by conducting demonstrations. <laughs> Actually, this was a documentary by Serena Shem. Uh, we are talking of it's a 20-minute documentary. It says a lot of things. Anyway, I'll end it here. I think Surinji will say a few words, and if we have time, we can have a little discussion around.